69. The Shadow. The last chapter ended with Zarathustra shooing the voluntary beggar away in the direction of his cave. Who is he going to meet now? Scarcely, however, was the voluntary beggar gone in haste and Zarathustra again alone when he heard behind him a new voice which called out, Stay, Zarathustra, do wait. It is myself, forsooth, O Zarathustra, myself, thy shadow. Another recurring character. And this character occurs not just in Zarathustra, but in Nietzsche's earlier books as well. The shadow is the one who is always with the spiritual wanderer, the only character he can converse with. Wherever the wanderer goes, he casts a shadow, which looks like him but isn't him. Metaphorically, it means that the shadow is the misinterpretation of his ideas, which people might arrive at. As a philosopher, he is always afraid that the readers will mistake his shadow for him. We met Zarathustra's shadow in great events, as he went to an island and came back with insights, but his listeners didn't get those insights because they were preoccupied by witnessing his shadow go to a different island. Now, the shadow wants to talk directly to Zarathustra, and calls on him to wait up. But Zarathustra did not wait, for a sudden irritation came over him on account of the crowd and the crowding in his mountains. Whither hath my lonesomeness gone, spake he, it is verily becoming too much for me. These mountains swarm. My kingdom is no longer of this world. I require new mountains. My shadow calleth me. What matter about my shadow? Let it run after me. I run away from it. Zarathustra doesn't want to speak to the shadow. He had enough of strange characters suddenly invading his kingdom. Thus spake Zarathustra to his heart and ran away. But the one behind followed after him, so that immediately there were three runners, one after the other, namely, foremost, the voluntary beggar, then Zarathustra, and thirdly and hindmost, his shadow. But not long had they run thus when Zarathustra became conscious of his folly, and shook off with one jerk all his irritation and detestation. What, said he, have not the most ludicrous things always happened to us old anchorites and saints? Verily my folly hath grown big in the mountains. Now do I hear six old fools' legs rattling behind one another. This is still the morning hours, so Zarathustra is running east, and the shadow is cast behind him. He tries to escape it, before realizing the folly of trying to escape his own shadow. But doth Zarathustra need to be frightened by his shadow? Also methinketh that after all it hath longer legs than mine. Thus spake Zarathustra, and laughing with eyes and entrails, he stood still and turned round quickly, and behold, he almost thereby threw his shadow and follower to the ground. So closely had the latter followed at his heels, and so weak was he. For when Zarathustra scrutinized him with his glance, he was frightened as by a sudden apparition. So slender, swarthy, hollow, and worn out did this follower appear. Who art thou? asked Zarathustra vehemently. What doest thou here? And why callest thou thyself my shadow? Thou art not pleasing unto me. Zarathustra turns around to face the shadow, expecting it to be longer than him, as it is in the early morning hours. Metaphorically, it means that since there are many ways to misinterpret him, the shadow of misinterpretation should be bigger than his philosophy. But he is surprised to find that the shadow is very small, meaning that without noticing, Zarathustra's wandering through the mountains took us almost to noon time. Metaphorically, it means that his philosophy no longer casts much of a shadow, and Zarathustra is troubled by it, to the point where he doesn't believe that it is indeed his shadow. Forgive me, answered the shadow, that it is I. And if I please thee not, well, O Zarathustra, therein do I admire thee and thy good taste. A wanderer am I, who have walked long at thy heels, always on the way, but without a goal, also without a home, so that verily I lack little of being the eternally wandering Jew, except that I am not eternal and not a Jew. The shadow admits it has become pathetic, but insists that he is indeed his shadow, who has been with him in all his travels. He likens himself, 
and thus also Zarathustra, to the wandering Jew, the Christian myth about the Jew who is doomed to wander for eternity without a land of his own, as punishment for his killing of Christ. Zarathustra, the God-killer, has doomed himself to always wander, when he chose his lifestyle. What? Must I ever be on the way, whirled by every wind, unsettled, driven about? O oh, earth, thou hast become too round for me. On every surface have I already sat, like tired dust have I fallen asleep on mirrors and window panes. Everything taketh from me, nothing giveth. I become thin, I am almost equal to a shadow. The shadow feels that the life of constant wandering, which made Zarathustra greater and greater, has only made him grow smaller and smaller. After thee, however, O Zarathustra, did I fly, and high longest, and though I hid myself from thee, I was nevertheless thy best shadow. Wherever thou hast sat, there sat I also. With thee have I wandered about in the remotest, coldest worlds, like a phantom that voluntarily haunteth winter roofs and snows. With thee have I pushed into all the forbidden, all the worst and the furthest, and if there be anything of virtue in me, it is that I have had no fear of any prohibition. The shadow doesn't share Zarathustra's greatness of spirit. But one thing he does have, since he followed him everywhere, is the courage to trespass any prohibition. He didn't gain anything from it, but he lost the fear. With thee have I broken up whatever my heart revered. All boundary stones and statues have I o'erthrown. The most dangerous wishes did I pursue, Verily, beyond every crime did I once go. With thee did I unlearn the belief in words and worths, and in great names. When the devil casteth his skin, doth not his name also fall away? It is also skin. The devil himself is perhaps skin. The shadow learned that the fear from evil things is just fear from their reputation. Humans were the ones who categorized things as good and evil and convince themselves that the evil things are dangerous. But it turns out that the so-called evil things can also be made into good things that bring joy. The devil is just a name that they created for these so-called evil things, and they realize that there's nothing to the devil beyond the name. Nothing is true. All is permitted. So said I to myself. Into the coldest water did I plunge with head and heart. Ah, how oft did I stand there naked on that account, like a red crab? Ah, where have gone all my goodness and all my shame and all my belief in the good? Ah, where is the lying innocence which I once possessed, the innocence of the good and of their noble lies? Crabs turn red when they are thrown in hot water. The shadow realized that when he followed Zarathustra into what he was told were the coldest waters, he actually turned red meaning that the waters were actually hot. It affirmed for him that nothing is true. By that, he means that nothing is eternally true. Water that is defined as cold can in other circumstances be hot. Everything that is defined as eternally evil by humans, and thus as prohibited, isn't really so, and can be good in other circumstances. Once you understand this, he says, everything becomes permitted. But once he lost his belief in eternal evil, he realized that there is no eternal good, either. Too oft, verily, did I follow close to the heels of truth. Then did it kick me in the face. Sometimes I meant to lie, and, behold, then only did I hit the truth. Too much hath become clear unto me. Now it doth not concern me any more. Nothing liveth any longer that I love. How should I still love myself? But here is where he is different from Zarathustra. When Zarathustra lost his belief in eternal good and evil, he instead took on everything considered evil and found ways to turn them into things that are harmless and joyful. Thus, he learned to love everything. But the shadow didn't realize he should adjust to learn to see any truth as temporary. He still needs everything to be clear, to be either eternally good or eternally evil, eternally true or eternally false. And once he realized there are no such certainties, he could no longer believe in anything. He made the journey with Zarathustra into the realms of nihilism, but failed to realize that this is just the first step 
and that you must adjust your mind to learn to find the things that are true and good for this moment and place, and live by them. Thus, he became alienated to everything, seeing nothing as true or good, and thus is incapable of loving anything earthly. To live as I incline, or not to live at all, so do I wish. So wisheth also the holiest, but alas, how have I still inclination? Have I still a goal, a haven towards which my sail is set? A good wind? Ah, he only who knoweth whither he saileth knoweth what wind is good, and a fair wind for him. Living by your inclinations is indeed something that Zarathustra teaches. But since you constantly change, your inclinations also change, and you have to adjust your values and lifestyle accordingly. The shadow doesn't get that. He believes that inclinations are stable, so when he realized he lost some inclinations while others were born, it made him believe that none of them are real inclinations, ones that he should live by. He also believes one should have a steady goal to strive for, not just temporary goals, and since the latter is all that he can find, he believes he has no goal in life. Thus, he is stuck in his passive nihilism. What still remaineth to me? A heart weary and flippant, an unstable will, fluttering wings, a broken backbone. This seeking for my home, O Zarathustra, dost thou know that this seeking hath been my home sickening? It eateth me up. Where is my home? For it do I ask and seek, and have sought, but have not found it. O eternal everywhere, O eternal nowhere, O eternal in vain. After all this wandering with Zarathustra, and the constant changing of values and goals it brought with it, the shadow feels that his character has become unstable. He yearns for some stability, somewhere he can feel at home, like he used to before all the wandering. But he can no longer go back there. Thus spake the shadow, and Zarathustra's countenance lengthened at his words. Thou art my shadow said he at last, sadly. Thy danger is not small, thou free spirit and wanderer. Thou hast had a bad day. See that a still worse evening doth not overtake thee. To such unsettled ones as thou seemeth at last even a prisoner blessed. Didst thou ever see how captured criminals sleep? They sleep quietly. They enjoy their new security. Zarathustra so realizes that yes, indeed, this is his shadow, the shadow that he cast with his philosophy. This shadow understood only parts of the philosophy, but missed other parts, and so it only made him miserable. It would have been better for him to remain a prisoner of the old belief, the belief in the eternal, true and good. Nietzsche is here acknowledging what his philosophy might do to some people. Undiscerning readers will absorb only parts of it. He realizes it is a dangerous philosophy that might destroy them. Beware lest in the end a narrow faith capture thee, a hard rigorous delusion. For now everything that is narrow and fixed seduceth and tempteth thee. Thou hast lost thy goal. Alas, how wilt thou forego and forget that loss? Thereby hast thou also lost thy way. This is only the beginning. His nihilism might lead this poor shadow to adopt some narrow and extreme worldview that will promise him an eternal truth. He needs to forget what he once learned, forget the idea that meaning can only be found in eternal truths, but he seems incapable of doing so. Hence, he is lost. Thou poor rover and rambler, thou tired butterfly, wilt thou have a rest and a home this evening? Then go up to my cave. Thither leadeth the way to my cave, and now will I run quickly away from thee again, already lieth, as it were, a shadow upon me. I will run alone, so that it may again become bright around me. Therefore must I still be a long time merrily upon my legs. In the evening, however, there will be dancing with me. Thus spake Zarathustra. This meeting cast a shadow on Zarathustra's thought as he came face to face with the bad consequences of his philosophy to other people. He needs to bid goodbye to the shadow, so he can think happy thoughts again. But he also feels pity for him, not to mention responsibility, 
so he invites him to his cave, where he may find some respite. Maybe, by the time Zarthustra returns there, he will find an answer that can help this poor creature.